Okay, we're on. My name is David Brooks. I am a columnist at the New York Times, and I work for The Atlantic. And five years ago, I founded, uh, co-founded Weave the Social Fabric Project. This is Fred Riley, the executive director of Weave the Social Fabric Project, the guy who actually uh, knows how to run an organization, something it <laughs> turns out I lack. I told people when Fred came on about three years ago, after two years of leadership under me, I would see how Fred ran the meeting, and it would be like, he'd give clear direction to the team. He'd offer positive feedback. It's like, whoa, is that how you do this? Um, so I had up to that time managed this whole one person, so I'm good at that. Uh, so I had been writing columns. I've been writing columns for the time since 2003. And starting around 2013, it occurred to me that all of, or many of the problems I was writing about had deeper roots. And whether it was political polarization, uh, some injustice, hate crimes, mass shootings, mental health problems, it had its roots in the social and relational fabric of our society. And something really bad is happening to that fabric. And so if you ask Americans, do, some, do you have close personal friends? The number of people who say they have no close personal friends has gone up by four times over the last couple of decades. Depression rates have gone up, suicide rates 35%, teenage suicide rates 58%. Uh, the number of people who are without a romantic partner is up by a third. The number of people who rate themselves at the bottom level of happiness has increased by 50% in the last 10 years. It's just something weird where people are lonely uh, and feel invisible and unseen. And so this seemed like just a deep social problem, which those of us in Washington, the most emotionally avoidant place on the face of the <laughs> earth, uh, <laughs> were not well equipped to deal with. But it occurred simultaneously that there were weavers out there, community builders, who were just phenomenal at building relationships. And we would go to a town, and we would say, who's trusted here? And we'd get pointed to the weavers, and you never knew who they were. There was a lady, uh, a friend of ours named Trebian Shorters, met in Florida, and she was helping people walk across, elementary school kids walk across the street after school, and he asked her, uh, do you have time to volunteer in your community? And she said, no. And he said, are you getting paid to do this? And she said, no, I just help the kids across the street. <laughs> and then he said, what are you doing after this? She said, I, I, on Thursdays, I bring food to the hospital. Do you have time to volunteer in your community? No, I have no time at all. <laughs> and so for her, that wasn't volunteering. That was just what neighbors did. And so we, would, we traveled around the country saying, who's trusted here? The one guy in Columbia Heights, D.C., uh, he was the guy who takes the money in the parking garage but he had a fascination with the city zoning rules. So if you had a problem with the city, you went to the parking garage guy and he helped you out. <laughs> and so he was the weaver. And so it was, it, we spent the, some of the horrible years hanging around with some of the most inspiring people. Uh, and it was, uh, it was deeply moving at times. I'm gonna show you a video in a minute and there's gonna be a clip of a tall black guy named Darius Baxter with his arm around a uh, shorter white woman. And his, uh, Darius has, uh, watched his mom, his dad die when he was nine. And the woman whose arm he's around, her husband killed their kids and himself. So these people had been through trauma. And they both had decided that they were gonna use their lives as a source of good and giving. And uh, the woman from Ohio said, I was, I would, I was motivated by anger. I wanted to show him if he wanted to ruin my life, he was not gonna do it. And so she has a free pharmacy, she helps women who have been suffered from abuse, uh, and she teaches uh, in local schools. And these are just beautiful people. And so the hope for the country seemed to us to be in them. And so the purpose of Weave uh, is to lift them up, and we'll talk a little more about that. But before we get into it, I just wanna show you a quick video from a conference we had, this was like four years ago, so it's a little dated, but I think you'll see, A, the faces of the people who are in local community really building it. But the other important thing to focus on the video is that it sounds all kumbaya, getting people together to rebuild community and build relationships, but you have to walk over some pretty hairy crap to get there. And so let's run that video and you'll, you'll see what I mean. A weaver is someone who is never kind of content with how things are. They're always looking to make things a little bit better or include a few more people. How I get to be a weaver is by listening and earning trust to build relationship 
so that people could allow me into their lives. I get to weave people with food, music, and art. I work with youth with mentorship, leadership, and entrepreneurship. I think every person right now is tasked with answering what does it mean for our country to weave, to come together. The way we create communities by empowering youth. I get to weed the LGBTQ people. I've had more than 14,000 to my own home for dinner in the last 13 years. I want to make sure that as we're weaving, we're looking at who isn't in the weaving, who isn't in the picture. The social fabric is a complex combination of relationships that can be complementary and contradictory at the same time. I feel like we're skipping a whole lot of things and going straight to railroading and paving over what's already been done. If this is going to continue, I need to see the folks that we forget up in here. I need to see those who are struggling with AIDS. I need to see, the, I need to see all of those people up in here. Relationships move at the speed of trust, but social change moves at the speed of relationships. I would like us not to sugarcoat and pretend that there aren't some deep systemic issues that still need to be addressed that aren't going to just be handled by saying, well, we differ. I sit in this room right here, right now, and I wonder how many people really get it. I got to go back to Greenville. I'm still black. And so for me, this right here is not just a feel-good moment, although it does feel good in this moment. My reality is I have to go back still being black. Yeah. when I leave here. I think that we, the people, have shown us, showed us that there's lots of challenges. I think I came into it thinking, okay, I'm gonna go back to my community and I'm gonna have like one, two, and three steps to help my community. But now I guess it's reinforcing that before you can make any change in your community, you have to make connections with people. Like as weavers, we have we still bring major blind spots to our work of weaving. Despite my best intentions, my privilege has an impact on what I do beyond my intentions. How do we make room for connection? How do we create connection between maybe people who don't agree? I think it's very important, not only to be able to tell my story, but to hear the stories of others and to see where other people come from. What I want is for you in this room to say, and I've said it before, I got you. Thank you. Yeah, I got you. Thank you. Thank you. No matter how hard it gets, how much pain is being circulated, we can't give up. Yeah, we're all coming to this work with trauma. That in many ways, that's what inspired us to start this work. You know, tough times don't last, but tough people do. And I'm in a room of 250 tough people. So for the next, I don't know however long we're here, let's start talking, to, let's be a solution network. A lot of us need to do things in our regular lives that weave people. We can all be weavers and we can go back and encourage our kids and our family members and our friends to, to weave. I know there's a lot of work to do, and I know there's a lot of pain to deal with, but we got this. We, it's, it's us. It's not you. It's not the Aspen Institute. It's us. We can do this. I hope that you all can feel how important what you do every single day really is. It reaffirms that the work that we are doing, we are on the right track. It just gives us a lot more energy to go back to our communities, knowing that other people are having the same challenges that we are, and so I can't wait to get back to my community and double my efforts. So as you can tell, the last guy there, he was from Nebraska. There were people from pretty much all over the country. And a lot of the work they do is exhausting and lonely and morally fulfilling at the same time. I never met one of those people who said, you know, I'm going to do this for you for years, then I'll go into something else. They all know why they were put on this earth and to do the project they're doing. And so it's inspiring to be around. And our theory of change finally was that uh, culture changes when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy. And so a lot of what we was doing, especially in the early days, was trying to let them tell their stories. Uh, and so now uh, Fred 
Tell us. Yeah. Now that you are running the show and it's gone from a, a sl the Gilligan's Island cruise to the... Well, I think, so the stats that you, that you shared earlier, I think what we started thinking about as we were erecting our strategic plan and how do we focus the work is we got to thinking about trust. Um, and we followed the social scientists who showed that most Americans have decided that we don't trust institutions and government anymore, right? We don't trust anymore. But I think the growing number is that people have decided that I don't trust my neighbor. And you live next door to your neighbor. And what happens in a community when you don't trust your neighbor, right? It used to be a time in which, and I want you to think about this, where you ran out of sugar, you're baking a cake. Where'd you go to get the sugar from? Now what do you do? You Instacart. Or you have Uber Eats drop you off some sugar. So we've gone from a time in which we depended on our neighbors to help us to going in our garage and shutting the door. But what we have found all around the country, so I always, I always describe the work like this. So in, when FDR took office in his first week, he was hit with the national banking crisis. Uh, folks had taken all their money out of the U.S. banks, and we were in crisis. And he did a fireside chat, and he got on the radio, and he said, go put your money back in the banks. You can trust me. It's better in the banks than it is under your mattresses. And you know what folks did? The next day, $20 million showed up in U.S. banks. Right now, do you know a leader in Congress, in the White House, in your mayor's office who can say, go do this and the whole community will do it? No. But I do know some community FDRs. There are people who live next door to you who will call out to their neighborhood and say, we have a food shortage, let's go build a community garden. There are kids who need coats, let's go collect coats together. And so our work settles on how do we support those people who are doing that in local communities? How do we fund their work? How do we give them tools so that they can like understand the science of the work that they're doing it, they're building trust and don't know it. Um, and then how do we share their story so that we can inspire others? We've decided that our work has to be on the ground, but it's not us telling them what to do, it's just supporting what they do and giving them a little more rigor so that they can do it better. Yeah, one of the guys on there, a Mexican-American guy named Pancho Arguiles, who spoke a couple times in the video, he uh, was running something when we met him called the Living Hope Wheelchair Association. And he would take uh, men, mostly undocumented workers who've been paralyzed, in construction accidents and he'd give them wheelchairs and catheters and diapers so they could lead dignified lives and then he trained them to be social workers and so you're somewhere in houston and 25 hispanic guys are wheeling in your neighborhood to help you fix your neighborhood's problems and it's the like the creativity yeah. that they bring to the their local projects that is so inspiring i once said to poncho you know you just radiate holiness and he said no i reflect holiness right the right answer now, describe some of the things we're doing now. Yeah, so, so our strategy is really how do we connect folks around the country who are weaving their communities together um, and, and support their work? How do we lift them up? And then how do we inspire more, right? And so we've built a community of weavers, um, an online community, which also has a learning center as a method to connect. You live in Albuquerque. I live in Chicago. I'm running a cool program. You can connect with those, person, those, those two groups together, and they can begin to support each other. We also launched Weaver Awards, because what we found is that the folks like Poncho and some of the other folks don't have access to philanthropy. They don't have access, they don't have the wherewithal or the time to write a large grant. And so we fund the work of these folks who are doing this community building work in their communities. And then as a method to spread the word of what they're doing, we take them through a rigorous communications training and we put them in a speakers bureau. And we have to place them on stages around the country so that you can hear from them and not David and I, because they tell the more inspiring and compelling stories. And then we have a weaver network, because I know you all are thinking, I, I don't need to weave my community together, there's no project, but we've built a network through working with the Points of Light Institute, which is an online repository of volunteer opportunities. Now, what we've said to the folks at Points of Light is that some of these, these 10,000 things you have listed on here are not weaving opportunities, because we believe they should be mutuality, right? So I'll give you an example. You go serve food at a, food at a, at a soup kitchen, and you're serving mashed potatoes, and you do that for two hours. That's really good, but it's not weaving. It's only weaving when you get off the line and go share a meal with the family and understand them. Because what we find is that people, listen, we're never going to agree on anything. So I know there are people around the country that say we're going to connect on our differences and we're going to talk them through and sing kumbaya and we're going to get it and we'll be one unit. That, I, this is my opinion. I don't believe that that can work. But I do believe what we can connect on is this human, this human kindness, this, human, this, this, this common humanity that we all share. And so if I hear your story and you hear mine, and you can connect to my story and I can connect to yours, you see me more as a person and not an issue anymore. And so we're forcing people in communities to connect on this common shared goal of building community and this humanistic side of us and not the differences. Now the differences can fall by the wayside and sometimes they aren't 
heard or said anymore. But once we start in relationship, then we have an opportunity to build a bridge to get on the other side. And we were uh, founded by folks like Mike and, and Dan Porterfield. Uh, and we were beneficiaries of the generosity of a lot of the donors to the Aspen Institute. And we are an Aspen program. But I'll be honest, when we entered some of these communities, let alone when we brought them to D.C. for a big meeting, I walk in the room with the Aspen Institute, with the New York Times, with PBS, with the Atlantic. I walk in with a lot of elite baggage. And so that trust had to be earned. And it was hard. If you saw the video at the end, we had a, it was in the round, and we were on this little 18-inch stage. And the folks there didn't want the stage. They didn't want anybody above anybody else. So it was an education and how you show up, you come in under. And, but that took a long time and it took a lot of, frankly, hard conversations, super hard conversations. And I just asked Fred, you know, now we're helping people serve some of these communities. You grew up yeah. in some of these communities. So tell the folks about, about that and what you learned and how it informs your work now. So, so I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. Um, does anybody know where Saginaw, Michigan is? Uh-oh, perfect. Um, but I grew, I grew up in a city that's uh, basically separ separated by bridge. Blacks live on one side, whites live on the other. Um, and it's a city that's run by General Motors. And so when General Motors leaves, the entire city crumbles, right? Small businesses, the school um, folks. My dad said when he moved to Saginaw, Michigan, they were like 150,000 people. Now they're less than 20. Right? So the city is suffering. Things are falling down. But when I grew up in the city, all those things were getting bigger, those issues. But what I found and what I, what, who I have become is because of that community. Right? It's my childhood pastor who was the personal weaver in my life, who's the first person to tell me I could be somebody important. Or my fifth grade teacher who said I was smart and took a real liking to me, who said you have to go to the school for the gifted. So she paid the fees and waited in the parking lot for me to take the test. Or it was my, my high school English teacher who knew for me that college was a next step and not a rite of passage for kids on the other side of town. So on the way to college, she would send me 50 bucks and 75 bucks to make sure that I could keep on the journey. So my life was knitted together by these local community actors who understand how to help the entire community move forward. Um, I recognize that a lot of us are reading the stuff that you write and they're watching the news and they're looking for folks in DC to help us fix these issues. Hold your breath, it's not gonna happen. And so if you wanna see changes in your community, get involved with some of these local projects because every city we've gone to, the people that David has described, the people that I described are residing in your community, go help them. Go join their journey, go work alongside them and see aren't you changed and see don't you get excited about what you see in your community. The blight that we hear about, the polarization that we hear about, there's another story if you get deeply connected in your community. So part of what we're doing, David, is, and I didn't say this in what we're doing, but we also are doing these on the ground uh, working communities. So we launched this project in Wilkesboro. It's a three-year, Wilkesboro, North Carolina. It's a three-year project where we go in first, the first six months, my team is on the ground having conversations with people in the community. We wanna know what the issues are. And their issue is that 75% of the people in the community voted for Trump, 25% voted for the other guy, and they are not getting along. And so we hired a local person, LB. She was our local on the ground weaver. And we just started giving her training in how to have conversations with people to tell your story, not to talk about politics, the story of self, right? Um, and Gantz's research out of the University of Chicago. And then we launch a local Weave the People where we bring the entire community together. And these are people who look different, talk different, have different political views, but the only conversation is how do we build a better community? What are your hopes and dreams for your community? And what we find out through those conversations is everybody has the same goal, right? We want this, we want that, and political ideologies move to the wayside. We launch our Weaver Awards and then we follow them over three years, giving them support as they continue to knit back together their community. Yeah, LB's a good example. So she grew up in this little town of Wilkes. Wilkes is in the Appalachian part of North Carolina. Uh, as they said when I uh, had dinner there, we may hate each other, but if you insult one of us, we'll kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and so they have it, they were the, the headquarters Lowe's hardware was founded in Wilkes. Part of NASCAR was founded in Wilkes, Holly Farms, and all those places left. And so they went through their opioid crisis in the 90s. They went through it early. And so LB grows up. Uh, she's lesbian, LBTQ. Uh, one day after school, a guy takes a baseball bat to her head. Uh, hate crime. And so she says, I'm getting out of Wilkes. And so she goes to LA, uh, and she goes to college there. And she's counseling LGBTQ kids. And she realized there are more counselors in this program than kids. So she realized where I'm needed is Wilkes. 
And we heard this again and again. If somebody had told her in high school that she would be moving back to Wilkes, they would, she would have thought they were crazy. But she moved back to run to be with the kids, uh, and that's what she does uh, in Wilkes. So it's, it's just an inspiring story of somebody who came back. But, you know, Wilkes is still facing, you know, there's no place for the kids to hang out. They don't have coffee shops. Uh, now they do, but they, they didn't before. The, they had the bowling alley, but it burned down. And so these are some of the, those places that are left behind. But, but David, I'll, I'll also tell you that what we found in the, in the last time we had a Weave the People event there a couple of months ago, um, but there is so much hope there. Everybody in the room is writing about how hopeful they are about tomorrow. And that's not something you hear on the ground in a lot of places. So they do have a lot of issues, but they're hopeful that things will change. And I'm going to ask the group in a few minutes, not right now, uh, if you can think of other examples or if you have theories of how this social change could happen or if you have people in your neighborhoods that might inform and inspire people. We want to make it just a little interactive, even though it's a little bigger group than anticipated. Can I first tell the group about why trust and why yeah. it matters? So, so in 1950, they st social scientists started asking this question and doing research on trust. And so they would go into a community and say, who do you trust? So if you think for a second, who do you trust and why do you trust? There's no real rhyme or reason why people trust each other. But social trust is a real dependability, um, a real I can count on you as a person. How many of you can count on your neighbor? Right? So if you were to do a project right now and say, how many of you can trust your neighbor by a show of hands, not this room, but the other people in the other rooms, nobody will raise their hands. But they have found that this research on trust, that, it, it, that when there's low trust in a community, uh, people don't vote. When there's low trust in community, people don't uh, trust the financial markets. They hoard their money. When they don't trust, people don't go to community meetings. So there's re don't, no real social cohesion. Um, and peace and harmony and things like life expectancy, mental health, all of these things go off the radar when trust is low in a community. So think about where you live and what are the big issues in your community, and I would guarantee you that there is a direct root cause, and it's trust. You know, not wanting to take the vaccine. Trust. Not wanting to follow authorities. Trust. And the, the problem is you get into a distrust doom loop where people start distrusting, and then they don't want to be in trustworthy ways, and then it just spirals yep. and spirals down. Yep. Um, what, describe some of the other things, and then we'll... We'll try to, we're going to do a group experiment. We'll see if we can have a conversation with 250 people, but we'll, it didn't work at the we for the people, but we're going to try. So, so what we try to do is, as you know, we work for the Aspen Institute and we're big ivory towers, I like to call it. I worked before that for about 16 years for various YMCA's around the country. Um, and I recognize that people don't trust you when you come in. And the, when we go in, they get really excited because they're like, the Aspen Institute, you got a lot of money. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I got I to raise all the money to do this myself, so no. But um, I, I, I think what we bring to this table is a real credibility, right? So I'll give an example. So we launched our Weaver Awards project in Baltimore. We gave 20 micro grants to 20 people who were doing really good work. First time we launched this, we only had 20 grants and we had 150 people apply. And these are folks that were doing really cool things all around Baltimore. So it was a hard decision. But when I first was reading the application, now our application process is super easy, right? Two paragraphs, two check boxes, and the person in the community who will say, you are who you say you are. But when I started reading the applications, I was like throwing them to the side. And they said, well, no, Fred, why are you doing that? And I said, this person spelled these words wrong. This sentence is a run on. It doesn't make sense. And she says, no, 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 you can't be on the selection committee anymore. And I said, why? <laughs> why? She says, well, because we're reading these for the heart and the humanity and the folks who are really doing this work. Because these are people who don't, aren't on the eyes of radar, right, of, of philanthropy. They don't have an iron doll 501c3, but they have a real heart for the work. And so I was kicked off. And then we had the, the bright idea to say, we shouldn't even be doing the selecting. So we pay a local community, a local group of community leaders, just like the folks who apply, and they sift through the applications. And what we found through the process is, is they are the better teachers and the better giver awayers of, that's even a, of the funds. Because what they do is they sit in a room, and I say, oh, I love application one. And they go, oh, no, 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 I know this person. They aren't doing good work. Person three is. And so we pick, it's all community driven. We just throw the resources to them, and then they take it off and go to work with it. It was a little disillusioning about the state of American philanthropy, frankly. Yeah. Because I was with a woman named Keisha Daniels who runs something called Sisters of Watts in Watts in, in L.A. And she described to me big groups from outside the neighborhood who got big grants to come into the neighborhood. They don't know what the neighborhood wants. They're not trusted in the neighborhood, and they leave after three years. And it's just a cycle, and it's disillusioning, folks. And I, did le I learned a couple things in this process 
The first was um, the neighborhood is the unit of change. You can't just pick one kid and take him out of the neighborhood. You have to take the whole neighborhood. As a friend of ours, one of our weavers, this guy, Mac McCarter in Shreveport, Louisiana, says you can't only clean the part of the swimming pool you're swimming in. Uh, and the second thing I learned is the neighborhood knows what ne it needs. They don't actually need outside consultants. They may need outside resources, but they actually know what their problems are and they know how to fix it. Yeah. And, and one last thing that I'll add to this, because the folks who we're supporting and funding um, don't really get flowers for the work that they do, us giving them this small drop in the bucket really helps to raise not only the rigor of the work, but they get so excited that somebody has said, you're doing a good job. A lot of this work that they're doing is thankless work, right? They're supporting people, the downtrodden people, who don't sometimes remember to say thank you. And us coming in to say thank you for this, and here's this extra funding so you can do the work a little deeply, a little more deeper, really goes an extra mile and makes them feel seen and heard and like a person and not just a machine who's been working forever to solve community issues. And we're going to we'll have a conversation. Fred and I will talk a little more. But we want other people who either think this is too small scale or have stories in their own neighborhoods or feel there's trust in their own communities. But we'll, we'll start by mixing it up. We'll start here, and then we'll go there. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We've got microphones coming. You've got to speak in the mic, because if not, it won't go on the recording. Hey. I, I can't tell you how moving it is to hear the story, uh, so meaningful at the grass roots that you're doing this. Do you have an idea of how many neighborhoods currently are being impacted? So we have weavers all around the U.S. Now, we're only working on the ground in three cities. Next year, we're going to go to almost 10, but we're working specifically with three. But there is a way, and I'll talk a little later, we'll put our QR code up. There's a way for you to tap into the resources now. So you can get our trainings. You can take the communications training to be a part of the Speakers Bureau. You can join the online community now. You can learn more about Weaver Awards. But all of that stuff, anybody can tap into it. But we're working specifically on the ground in three communities now. And next year, it'll be 10. We're in Aspen and Vail. No, uh, no, 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 no. I think this young lady over here. Has okay, let, no. uh, I'll catch you. We'll, Let's go we'll here come first. To you. Well, you're next. Let's go here first. Huh? Yeah, you're, you're up. So I, um, I live in Pennsylvania, and after the peaceful protests in Philadelphia, I literally I eventually got in my car, and I drove all through rural Pennsylvania to Trump country um, with the intention to uh, represent black and brown voices in those spaces after that time. I ended up making relationships with Republican county commissioners. Um, I'm just so curious how we can extend what you're doing, because I also do this work. I know other people do this work. I happen to be um, a national new uniter from the President's United We Stand Summit. Um, we're looking at launching a national initiative to bring the country together. And that's my conversation with you. I'm a uniter. You're a weaver. we got other people. And I need to know, I'm here and in a separate realm, but I, I love your story. I love your work. We need to talk about how we can make it so other people that don't come to these places, yeah. that aren't in those things, can get it because that's the problem. The people that are disengaged, the people that are disinformed, the, di the, the people that are distraught, right? We need to really coalesce as entities within this country with the same intentions to build it out and really touch people. So I'm interested in working with you on a national level because we, our country needs us. And what you're doing at your scale, what I'm doing at my scale, what the Uniters are doing, we all need to work together. So that's my plug. So let me just say yes and yes. And uh, we would love to figure out how we could work together. You know, one of the, I was sat on a panel last week and they said, what's your issues with folks working in this space. I was like, my issue is I'm talking to you all the time, right? I don't need to talk to you because you get it. I need to be out in the community. But I think part of our Speakers Bureau is really placing those everyday people who are doing it. And the folks don't want to hear from me, right? And so they need to hear from the folks who are real close to the issues. And so that's why we are placing them on stages and giving them training so they can tell the stories of the great work they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So let's figure out. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. So yeah, we'll, we'll exchange information at the end. But yeah. Yes, it's perfect. So I was in Central Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago, and I ran into a liberal New York Jew. Uh, and I said, what? what do you move here for? Uh, and she said, the people are so wonderful. 
and this is like an 80-20 Trump county. And, it, and I, you know, in my travels in this work, I've like, I don't do, make generalizations about Trump voters anymore. Because everyone has a story. At the We the People event, we had a few Trump administration people in the room. They didn't quite feel they had space to talk. But then in the end, I, I got one to get up and say she worked for Trump. And I could see the whole room go, oh, they're here. <laughs> 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 Let's go over here. <laughs> um, hello. Hi, I'm Karen. Thank you so much for this great panel, uh, this great conversation. I'm from Jerusalem. And um, I, I'm here actually at the conference to talk about something that we're doing in Jerusalem that really resonates with what you, what you all are doing here. Um, I'm, I'm with an arts organization, and as a result of a, of a major crisis we had in Jerusalem in 2014, there was a, a major war between uh, Israel and, uh, and Palestinians. Um, we wound up uh, having to, using our artistic tools to seek out the moderate voices of Jerusalem who were willing to sort of sign on to a, a public call. Um, against, uh, that th there's room in the city for everyone. The violence got very bad in the streets of, of our city. And as you know, it's a very complicated, diverse city. And it wound up leading us to discover that the city is full of, you call them weavers, we call them boundary dissolvers. And we discovered and started collecting extraordinary people from all walks of life, all communities, who completely blew away any, all of your expectations. And in a city where people believe that nothing is possible, where, the, where ac accumulated uh, the accumulative effect of, of encountering these people blew your mind and made you realize that there is potential in this most contested of cities. And what we wound up doing, because we're an arts organization, is we invited artists to look at this phenomenon and then create out of it. And we created something called a, a journey of dissolving boundaries that are journeys that go throughout Jerusalem where you encounter these people that are part theatrical, part documentary. And so I'm curious, and it's something that takes the story out and allows lots of people to experience. I'm curious if you've ever f uh, engaged with artists uh, if you've thought about it, as a way also of amplifying um, the very, very powerful stuff that you're discovering. Let me, let me say a few things about, first, Israel, because it was very instructive to me. I used to cover Israel uh, when I was a foreign correspondent. Uh, Israel is a place that is obviously bitterly divided. Jerusalem is obviously bitterly divided. But it's also a place that, in my experience during the Intifada, it's especially that people come together in, in a moment. And like I, I had a friend who was back in the day when you called directory assistance. He called directory assistance to get the number for a restaurant, I think named Ocean. And the operator said, nah, you don't want to eat there. <laughs> and it's, it's a country where people do not necessarily recognize the distinction between private life and public life. <laughs> like everything is private. Uh, and, and so there's something very beautiful. I mean, obviously the divisions are what they are, like they are in a lot of countries. But there's something very beautiful about that. And uh, while we were on our tour, I ran into a couple uh, who had moved from Israel to, to San Diego, and they were living in a suburb. And the, f the husband was away working somewhere, and they were on a phone call. She hangs up, and she's going to go put their four-year-old to bed. And uh, uh, she can't find him. And so she's running around the house. She runs out, looks in the bottom of the pool. She's terrified. And then she's running up and down her neighborhood, screaming out his name. And she sees some lights click on, but nobody comes out to help. And... She comes back in, and she's found he's made a little fort out of cushions, and he's just asleep there. It's all fine. The next day, she's walking her dog or something. Some neighbor said, yeah, I heard you screaming your kid's name last night. What was that about? And she was like, in Israel, people would have been out there in their underwear looking for the kid. And so the, it, it was a testimony to a little of what, you know, once you lose that trust, people stay in their rooms. And I don't know, you can talk about the arts, maybe. So we probably do a couple of different things. So our project in Wilkesboro, when we launched our local Weave the People, everybody who came, about 150 people, did a postcard to home where they would write their vision for what their home is. And then at the end of our time with them in Wilkes, a local artist will turn it into a mural downtown with all the postcards that everybody else has created because we want to leave something behind to remind them of the great work they've done over the three years. Then one quick example, we funded a project in Baltimore, $5,000 for a micro grant, uh, Miss Gloria and Erica in this community where they called the police 100 times for folks selling drugs, um, doing drugs, and all type of illicit behavior in the alley. 
So we gave them $5,000, and they built a stage, cleaned out the alley, and now they have artists perform on this stage. Now, what that money did, the $5,000, they're now in competition to have $1.7 million worth of city funding now to rebuild the entire street because they launched a project with the $5,000. And so it's all because of the micro grant that it spurred this continued action that they're doing in Baltimore. So, and, and arts is what started it. Yeah, let's get to Ellen. Before, as we get to the mic to Ellen, uh, one of the things that was frustrating to me is my own business, the media. Uh, we it's have your a, business, though. Uh, well, I haven't been able to fix it. It's, we have a broken theory of change. Our theory of change is that if we describe how bad the problems are, then we've done our job. And so it's been phenomenally hard to get coverage for a lot of these folks. Yeah. Is, it, is this on? Yes. Hi. Thank you, guys. Um, so one of the things that I find... Um, fascinating and refreshing about what you're doing and I was speaking with Michael um, before about this uh, because both he and I were based in Kenya for a long time um, I used to run the Flying Doctors of Africa and one of I think the beautiful things about rural communities and at least where I worked in East Africa is community is still community and part of the reason why community is still community um, might not even be philanthropic or kind. It's out of need. You know, I'm in danger. You know, neighbors, we're going to help each other because we have to. But one of the really evolved things that goes on over there is um, with the brain drain, with people trying to take, um, you know, the smartest and the brightest to leave and go to Oxford or Harvard or whatever. The communities say, uh-uh, you know, you want to take our students, our best and brightest? They go home to their community to elevate the whole community. It's a cultural imperative. And it seems very close to the DNA of what you're talking about, which is let's not just bring one person up. Let's hold hands and realize we need to bring everybody up. And, and I just think that's terrific. There's a... Um a guy who's a friend of the Aspen Institute named Kennedy O'Dayday who runs a program called Shafco in Kibera, one of the slums. My kid was a kindergarten teacher there. And A, the first thing that was interesting was uh, they had this rickety swing set and the kindergarten girls would fall off the swings and if they were American kids, he expected them to cry. And they never cried. They were like, it hurts, fine, I can deal with it. But the other thing was the intense interconnection between those communities. And the sobering thing for me once on a visit to Kibera, I asked one of the people at a different, who lived in this slum, how many NGOs are there in here? And there was like 3,000. It's sort of the big slum. It's sort of the glamour slum. Or something. And I said, how many are doing good? How many doing harm? How many doing not neutral? And she said, 20% good, 20% harm, the rest neutral. And so it shows you how hard the work is and why you need these lifers. Uh, Kevin Frank, I'm from Atlanta. Um, so I don't know if you all know about Cop City within Atlanta. Um, recently, we had about 15 hours of public outrage, right? And people were coming together, like you said, weavers who are like for, standing for something they want to be believed in. But how do you keep those people hopeful who sat there and trying to fight and still are, and still are fighting and arrested and things like that? How do you keep them hopeful but still stay connected, still keep fighting the good fight? So, so you want to take it or right. So I think what we've done is is really through our work is highlighting what they're doing and get some attention to them. So for an example, last year we brought Danielle Battle f with us from the Cherry Hill neighborhood in Baltimore, who she and her husband have actually like rebuilt the entire street. Like it's a, it's a, it's a rough neighborhood. I was walking through the streets with her with somebody from the Pew Research Center that were taping a podcast together for her. And um, folks are opening the doors and she'd go, oh, he's cool, he's with me. And I was like, oh, thank you for that. But what we decide to do is that the work shouldn't be about us. And so if we bring in, uh, if we bring in a reporter or if there's funding, it should go to the folks on the ground who are actually doing the work. And that's how we feel we keep them motivated. Because these are folks who weren't getting any support before, and now they are. So. But I was shocked at how big a problem burnout is. Yeah. Because yeah. like when you, if you're working for money, you're working hard. But if you're working for the soul of your neighborhood, you're working really hard. That's, yeah, I've, I've read that I don't have to be the solution. I have to be just a piece of the solution. I just wanted to say I love what you're doing. It's incredible. 
And on days like this, I'm proud to be an American because this is what you all do, and it's unbelievable. And it's a wonderful side of patriotism and hope and all incredible things. My question is, you said the word scalability. I'd love you all to make this a thousand times bigger and to touch every city in the country. So question is, number one, how scalable is it? How do you do it in, in 10 years? Where would you like this to be? And how do, how do you get there? And how can we help? Okay, so that's, you're going to make my, my, my head pop off, right? Because I'm always thinking, uh, that sounds like a lot of people. But let me tell you what our plan ultimately is. And so we're going to continue to test and perfect our, and perfect our model on the ground, which is why next year we're going to go to 10 cities. Because I want to make sure that what we're doing actually works and you can measure it, right? So our good friend Mike is like, what are you counting? I want to know what you're measuring, right? And so he's one of our early investors in the work. And so we're perfecting it so we can know whether it's working or not. But then on the next phase of this work, we want to be able to train communities how to do this themselves because I can't be everywhere. We're not going to, I don't want a, a huge team of 150 people. And so as we continue to perfect our model, we're going to be training other communities how to do this themselves so that it'll take the middleman out. Like we'll train you now, you can go launch this in your own community. Because there are groups that are grappling with how to do this work in their community. We'll just show them how and we'll show them what works and what has worked in other communities. And the, the other thing I'd add is that uh, if we really are focusing on people who are just good at building relationships, yeah. like the guy the, who, sent, the, who believed in you, that person. Yeah. And that's relationship, and relationships don't scale. And so sometimes it's, we can't think of, like, we're McDonald's. We're going to have, like, just massive organization. But norms scale. And so if you can get change people to change their behavior, how, what they think of as normal. So the lady in Florida who's walking the kids across the street, if we get more people to think well, of course I'm going to do that in my neighborhood because that's what a neighbor does, then you can have that can scale. And so a lot of it is changing just pe how people think of what their role in life is. We have a, I have a friend who says, I practice aggressive friendship. And so the person who had 14,000 people eating at their house, that's aggressive friendship. They're like, they're doing the inviting. And if you can get people who think, yeah, doing the inviting is what I'm going to do, then you don't, we don't need to scale, but the norms have shifted. And that, that was the emphasis on shifting the culture, not just creating a bigger organization. Yeah. One more point, and then I'm going to go to this young lady here. Um, the issue is, is that a lot of people see a leader looking as a different person, right? And so you go to these, I spoke at a huge um, um, convening of community foundation leaders. And so somebody said, how do I find weavers in my community? And I was like, wait a minute, but it's your community. How do you find them? So I said, well, who are you funding now? And so they started naming these big organizations. We fund this group and we fund the Boys and Girls Club. Not that they aren't uh, good organizations, but they are, right? But I was like, how do you find people who can get to the people and then have them follow them? And so you get that with neighborhood leaders. So we also have to change who we see as leaders, right? And so if, you can, if we change who we see as leaders, we can move some of these things faster. Yes, ma'am. Sorry for the wait. Um, I'm MJ. I'm actually here. I'm, I'm, I say I'm local, but I'm in Denver, Colorado. I am an abolitionist of the child welfare system. Um, and, and I always announce myself that way because my question to you is, in the work that I do, people talk a lot about, we have this idea of the victim and the savior and the perpetrator, right? So the parents are the perpetrator, the victim is the child, the savior is usually white culture colonizing. So with that, when I say that I'm in the system, and I actually fight for parents, and they go, what about the kids? And we come from collective cultures, right? We come from indigenous cultures where when you are supporting that parent, you are saving that child. <laughs> you are supporting that child. And the reason why I want to ask you this question is because when people know what I do, I have a nonprofit, but I'm a consultant with attorneys. All I do is consult with attorneys to put race on the record so we can fight racism in the court system for, for families. And we know that p children of color are more negatively impacted by, ch by child welfare, and it's usually because poverty is looked at as neglect, um, and we don't treat that poverty piece, right? So my question to you is, how do you help change the narrative? Because I'm in an industry, I'm in the foster care industry, it's a $33 billion a year industry, right? So there's a narrative that keeps us going, that keeps the money coming, but it does not support the families and it does not support the communities. So the narrative is that the parent is bad. When you are working with these communities, we know what we need to do in order to be sustainable and to heal. How do you help change those narratives? Because it is greatly hard for myself to get funded um, whenever I say I support the children and the parents and the grandparents, right? 
So, so I don't even know how to answer that question, but let me tell you what we do, right? So our, our on-the-ground activation has been funded by a large bank and a large foundation for us to do the first three cities that we're working in. And we say that we were building the project together with them, but we forced them. The bank says that they were a community bank. And I was like, you got to put your money where your mouth is. And if you're a community bank, you have to really exhaust all the ideas you had before, right? Um, some of the applications that came across my desk was a lady who was, she was a doula who said that you could do this. And I was like, I don't even know what this is, but we funded her work because the community all believed in her and they followed her. And so we believe if you really trust the community, the philanthropy should work that way, but also the voices that you raise up can do that as well. I don't know if I can change the narrative, but those folks who are, we are funding can, that's what I would say. That's, that is because we are making sure that the work reflects the community and the community has a voice and it's not, I can't, I always say I've worked myself out of being a local leader. I'm just not anymore. I don't even understand what happens. I live in a, I work in a, in an ivory tower in DC and I live in a condo in DC and I don't know what happens in the neighborhood. And so I shouldn't be involved in helping communities we're working in source through it, but I can bring tools and resources and let them source through it themselves. Can I ask you a question I can't resist? Uh, so in DC, we had this big argument about the child tax credit which expanded for a little while and then it struck back down. You were on the ground. Did that have a material effect on the people you were working with? 1,000%, 1,000%. Like everyone sees problems, right? And that is the Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have time for maybe one or two more. I was born and raised in India, and this concept of these communities of care and, and um, this concept of weaving sort of permeates through our culture. And similar to the story you described about the woman from Israel who moved to San Diego, those, those countries in the eastern parts of the world have gone through some very polarizing elections and social events, yet that concept still remains. Why is it that when things like that have started happening in the Western world, we've sort of retracted into our silos and gotten away from what feels like we used to do pretty well? Uh, so I think there's a lot of things that contribute to that, right? I've been studying trust. You can blame so many industries or the, you could blame the, the creation of the airline industry because at once before you couldn't get to DC and figure out what your legislators are doing, now you can fly in really fast or social media or all these things. But what we do know is that in third world countries and other developing countries around the world, the US, our trust levels are dwindling, but in other countries they're growing. And they're growing because they're including everybody's ideas and their voices in the conversations. They're working proximate to the communities that they are serving. Um, they are really open and honest governments. And so I think those are some of the things that we have to think about why they, why other countries are trusted, the scores are raising, and ours are dwindling. Yeah, so I, I only teach at colleges I couldn't have gotten into. So <laughs> I, 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 I teach it, I've been teaching at Yale on and off for 20 years, and I have students from all over the world. And we always say, what do you want to do after school? And a lot of kids from a lot of different parts of the world say, well, that's not really only my choice. That's the village. And so they just, ha we have a hyper-individualistic culture that has grown more hyper-individualist over the last 20 years. And I even talk to, I bug State Department people about this. The World Value Survey surveys values all around the world. And they find these cultural blocks, India, Latin America, Africa, China. And every other block is more collective or more communal than ours. And that's always been true, frankly. But over the last 20 years, our block has drifted off away from all the other blocks into a much more individualistic world. And so to me, part of our foreign policy challenge 
is to actually understand that our culture is weirdly different than the way a lot of other people around the world see how one should lead their lives. And we have a lot of positive benefits from individualism, creativity, and we've got songs like Free Bird and Rambling Man, very... <laughs> That's our uh, That's but, but there are downsides to individualism, which we're now paying for. So, 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 let's so hold on, one, no, we can't, we, we're, we're time, our time is ending, so I, I need to close <laughs> out, but we'll be around for a second, I'm sorry. So, so, so before we go, I want to remind you, you can learn more, you can get more information on Weave, is the, get the, join the QR code and you can find out more information about our online community, um, the Weaver Network, and all the other things we, we, we offer. But before we go, I'm going to close with this, right? I want you to think about weaving. And the act of weaving are, is a bunch of different threads coming together to make one particular pattern. Right now in this room, we're a bunch of different threads coming together to make one pattern. At your home, wherever that is, there are a bunch of different threads coming together to make one pattern. We have these weave pins. Um, Michael's in the back, and we'll have some around. Um, but I want you to go home and find the weaver in your community who are connecting all these threads together um, so that things can become one, so that we can become one. Thank you so much for your time. Go home and go eat.